All right, so here's 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 the vi uh, here's the um here's the page again. We thought uh we had enough time in that recording, but we had to make some more time and here is the video right here where um from Time magazine we only have a portion of this because now they're charging, you know, to see the Time magazine you know, trying to make money off of their newspaper figure charge for information. That's why when you find these things for free, you should try to save it and back it up. We did, but we don't have it all here to, if we go in the archives and find it out. Anyway, if you're not a time subscriber, you can become a current subscriber, full access, so forth and so on. But here, this is from, this is from Monday, November 16th, um, 19, 1970. So this is Monday, November 16th, 1970. And this is a portion of this particular article right here where it states where it states that Ethiopia's Emperor Haile Selassie was a monarch of only 43 when his proud East African kingdom suffered one of the greatest outrages. It's still one of the greatest outrages of the 20th century, but you'll never find that out when you watch about World War II and who was affected and who was hurt and, and what really went on. They, they, they barely even give um, Ethiopia a proper hearing. You know, the, the, the weapons of mass destruction and the, the biological and, and chemical weapons used against the defenseless Ethiopians, because that right there was the... Fulfillment of Revelation, the martyrs, those dressed in the white robes, the robes of righteousness. Because Ethiopia at that time, it was a very biblical society. There's many, many witnesses, people who love Ethiopia, people who, who don't have that much affection. They all witness that so-called primitive or Hebraic, Judaic sense of Ethiopia at that time of um, the coronation of his majesty and the early days right prior to the fascist invasion by the tin pot Caesar named Mussolini. Now it says, while the League of Nations sat, in, uh, sat mute, dumb, deaf, and blind, sat mute in Geneva or Geneva in 1936, Italian troops overran the land. And Benito Mussolini appeared on a Rome balcony to boast, now pay attention, at last Italy has its empire. Notice that. So up to this time, 36, so Ethiopia was important to that so-called mentality, the satana mentality of Mussolini of the Vatican, of all those who conspired against Christ and his kingly character and against those blameless Ethiopians, those, those true Judeo-Christians who they massacred, right? And it tells you down here, I think right here, yes, 7,000, well, 760,000. says, Ethiopia paid a high price for Il Duce's Caesarian pretensions, now, what's a C-section? Huh? Caesarian pretensions. By the time British troops crushed the Italian invaders in 1941, they should really say British and Ethiopian troops now having modern weapons, British weapons, crush the Italian invader. So you can see the racism in this, too, because there's other reports that are more um, fear and balance and, and show that the Ethiopians were more than equal participants in their own liberation. It says 760,000 Ethiopians had been killed. They should really be murdered, had been murdered. And we're talking about men, women, and ch or really w w children, women, and men, if we put it in the order that they killed the Ethiopians, children, women, and men. Even so, Selassie ordered his people to treat the defeated Italians with a, with a sense of honor. Now, there's more to this article, and we have to get the rest of this article, but the main part that tells you a lot right here is the title. From no, November, Monday, November 16th, 1970, Ethiopia, no hard feelings, but no obelisk either. And that was a big contention. Um, 
after the time of the war, I mean, they, you know, the, the Italians made all sorts of excuses like the arc. I mean, I mean, the, I mean, the obelisk was um, was too big, and they couldn't get it back to Ethiopia. Although they got it from Ethiopia, remember we're in more modern times. They made all sorts of excuses until recently, around the Ethiopian millennium, around 2007. Um, they said some freak lightning or lightning strike hit the top of the obelisk, and that sent, sent you know, the Romans into a shiver, because you have to recognize that in Rome, lightning in Rome, to the Romans, lightning was a bad portent. Lightning was a bad omen. It's like, a, oh, God, you know, it was a bad omen, you know, for, for lightning, you know. So, so that's one thing they feared in Rome. And it goes all the way back to um, Greco-Roman, Romano-Greek, times you know that lightning was a bad was a bad omen especially among the 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 Caesarians or the Caesarians now that's one reason why we want to show you that right there now the next thing that we wanted to show in connection and in now investigating this whole um so-called uh, imposter pope and the witness of his imperial majesty in this particular and to this particular incident is uh, demonstrable, as we just showed before, with the particular um, picture. Let's let, let, let's let's change this. So we, we'll get to the Lateran, the 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 Concord, the Lateran um, Treaty, the 1929 Lateran Treaty, that is very very important to connect. You know, to connect the dots. When one want to know, well, how is all this prophetic? When we understand what happened in 1928, um, Rastafari became Nigus or King Tafari. Then 1929, Mussolini and the Lateran Treaty helped to heal that deadly wound of 1,260 years, according to Revelation prophecy. And now Rome or the Vatican now became, it, it, it was now the Pope was a king again because the Pope was a king before, but he had lost that kingship um, roughly um, 1,260 years before. Now, also in tune for all these events is the, the stock market crash. Remember that stock market crash, you know, that dark day, that dark day in financial, in financial world history. So that, that's a little more on the latter entreaty to understand how... Um, uh, El Duce or Mussolini was instrumental and was a part of that cabal in helping the Vatican now become heal that deadly wound. And even the newspapers from the time actually state that this deadly wound, the very words of scripture, that this deadly wound had been, that this deadly wound had been, um, Healed in this uh, in in this present in this present time. Now, we thought we was able to open this up right here. You understand? Um, but perhaps we have a lot of things running. And let's just once again just 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 recap that there's these two popes, Pope Paul the Sixth. One is an imposter, and one was the real pope that they had elected from the start. And then he was replaced by this this actor right here. Um, there are there are other shots of it that demonstrate clearly um, the difference between these two men. Now, His Majesty, at this particular, we have to find exactly where this was. Um, it doesn't look like a, a, a visit, you know, to the Vatican. It looks like it could be somewhere else. Perhaps it was at the UN. Perhaps it was some other kind of international um, function. But it's very clear right here, you know, the, the rapport between the two men seems genuine, seems sincere. His majesty is very relaxed. There's no funny Masonic grips. It's a regular handshake. It's not on, on the knuckle or something like that with the thumb and all that crazy stuff. It seems to be a very sincere, you know, you can see the expression, the relaxedness on the two men and even on everyone else who's witnessing this scene. Now, that article we just showed you from 1970 is concerning this particular meeting here that, that there's a video. We have a video of this where you actually see this in black and white but in real time. 
And when we watched the video, when we seen the video some years ago, first of all, it was like, what? Imagine you met the Pope, you know, like, you know, we always say fire burn the Pope, but then we're like, why is matching me the Pope? And we're watching the video, and it is a very interesting video, but His Majesty's expression was always very curious to me, and I could never explicate, like to explain exactly why, but now I can. And this particular photo they have there, they put an X on it, but they figure, you know, we're going to use it, and they want people to pay them for it, so forth and so on. But we can actually get still shots off of the video. But if you notice and observe, even this still shot here, His Majesty's face, as His Majesty looks at this person. Remember, this they're saying this is the same person as the picture before. In other words, they're saying that that is the same individual, you understand, as this particular individual right here, this particular pope right here. And they're telling us both of these are the same. But we're learning that they're not the same, is that there was some big Satanistic cover-up. Now, when His Majesty comes into, I think it's the Quirinale, right, the, the Imperial, Italian Imperial Palace, not the Vatican, but Quirinale, where state and, you know, functions, remember the Pope sends a ladder and treaty that Delhi wound was healed after 1,260 um, years, just like the biblical prophecy, um, Revelation, Donnell states. And now we learn that there's an imposter Pope. And then when we compare the features on these two men, we can see clearly you understand? Know like this is a good shot right here. We can see clearly that they are not the same. They are not the same um, individual. Let's uh, see if we can make this a little smaller so you can see this right here. They're clearly not the same individual. If I were to ask you, who do you think this is right here? Besides saying all white men look the same, you understand? Know it's clearly that this is this man right here. But then if I were now to flip it, and say, well, well, who is this man right here? Who is this man right here? Which one is he right here? It's very clear, even from the eyeglasses, that this is this man. Now, when you look at his majesty's face in the video, his majesty is looking steadfastly on him. You understand? And he's looking around at the, at the others, at the others in his entourage, to see whether they pick up on it. You know, whether they pick up on it. And um, it's almost like his majesty comes, speaks, you know, gives his speech, you know, and it's a very, it's not warm. You know, the reception is definitely not warm. And I was wondering, okay, maybe it's just the Vatican and the Pope and all that, like we say, fire burn the Pope. But then when we see this picture here, it is a whole different, uh, as we say, Bamarinia, a whole different tabai. It's a whole different tabai in this particular photo. And like you can notice right here, if we just focus on, if we just focus on these two individuals right here, let us bring this up right here, and you can see this might be a better a better let's move this over right here so you can so you can see this full on the screen right here. We'll move this here and we'll move this here um actually, let's move this a little bit more over here and that and move that down. Can you still see this this um Here we go. Let's go like that. All right, and bring that, bring that up right here. All right, so let, 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 let's move it like this right here. Can you see this difference? You can definitely, but they're claiming that these both are the same, are the same, are the same popes. Now, we, we're, we're not going to rehash all the information that's out there on, on this counterfeit pope, you understand, or this... um imposter pope. In other words, we might say the pope popery is impostery in itself and that might be a point, but it's almost like, you know, they put somebody else in as Obama and we can clearly see it's not Obama, but they're telling everybody and you go see him and, and you like, This is Obama. Obama what? Obama Junior? Obama who are you know what I mean, who are you? But it still is mad he conducts this business and it's like he gets out of there. But there's, there's, the, the video is a very cryptic video. It's a very cryptic video. And now we understand much better 
why when his majesty looks upon him and the camera zooms in and gets a close shot of his majesty looking upon this um this counterfeit or this imposter rather imposter pope seeing that he had already met the real man just a little bit earlier. And probably also they didn't announce such and such. They basically said his highness, Pope Paul the Six, and he looks at him, Pope Paul the Six. You know, and then when you see the video you can see how um the Pope also keeps his poker face too. This this imposter. He keeps his poker face. And I was wondering why there were so many of these other cardinals and others there in the room. It's almost like even the attitude of the Jesuits and the attitude of the the, 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 the papal people, you understand, are very interesting too. And when his majesty is walking into the palace, I think maybe when he turned, he vibed where the real man was. Because we're thinking, like, when you watch the video, we're thinking, like, what, they're trying to do something to his majesty? Like, they're leading him the wrong way? Because, like, they, they're leading him, and they turn, like, right, or turn, yeah, they turn right, and then the, the film breaks, and then you see his majesty leading them and coming into the room. And so it, 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 it's, it's, it's a weird part. And all this time you see how his majesty is holding his sword. You know, holding his sword. Now, if we can just get this other piece of, you know, this other piece of documentary um, evidence right here, so we can complete this this cipher. Yeah, uh, Satan, like the, the the devil is trying to prevent us from opening. You know this particular documentation here. It, it's it's kind of almost bluntly kind of obvious because this is the second time we are um you know we are let's just close this force close this right there and it's like yeah we might have to restart as you can see you know because you know a lot of this technology you know you see whose logo is on it like Christ said you know whose inscription. You know whose inscription is on this. So uh, let's see if we can bring this up one more time. This document on on Hermas, the shepherd of Hermas, and the mistranslation of it, the miscarry, the misrepresentation of it. So let's go uh, Hermas one more time. And if it doesn't open, we'll we'll prepare it and and try to have that to you um, shortly. But the the scripture known as Hermas really explains it, because somewhere we read that it was one of somehow His Majesty liked that book, or that was one of the the particular earlier Christian documentations that His Majesty um, um, was uh, inclined to read, you know, and we don't know who particularly said so or why and we looked over uh, the shepherd of Hermes or Hermes the shepherd before and we know this it's a very interesting read and there's a lot of wisdom in there but there's one particular area that really helps to explain this particular um, Pope Paul the six and the imposter and his majesty's reaction and his majesty even deciding after the Italians had had said right here, um, uh, Ethiopia, no hard feelings, but no obelisk either. In the further part of this article that we're not able to access because um, Time Magazine want money for it, even though we have gotten the article elsewhere, it basically explains that his match was reluctant because it's like the Italians hadn't kept their word, you know, hadn't done what they had said they would do. Now, who he communicated with or who he spoke to would not really absolutely say, okay, here we go. Hallelujah. Finally, we got this document right here. Now, let's see if we can um, bring this more into, um, more into perspective right here. And we're going to go through this at a little lively pace, so please, um, please stay, uh, stay, stay, stay tuned right here. Uh, let's open this. This is from page uh, 15 do we have a wide enough a wide enough shot 
to have that all in um in frame so let's um let's go one two five hundred twenty five percent okay let's move this over okay is this is this good just just it's, it's just it's just it just it's just right okay that should be good right there okay this is from the shepherd of hermes right the new version greek manuscript so called right now this is what um the author is writing about um Gail Ripplinger's mischaracterization of this particular document. Now, she makes it appear that the newer translation slavishly followed the Leif manuscript when a Leif is never followed unless it agrees with other manuscripts. It's talking about different manuscripts, which they name by the Hebrew, like A manuscript, B, C manuscript, so forth and so on, but these are the Hebrew letters, right? She implies that such writings as the Shepherd of Hermes and the Epistle of Barnabas are thought to be canonical by the newer translation when they are contained in none of them. She is a master of the art of guilty by association, this particular um, Gail um, Ripplinger. We're going to call her Gail Ripplewinkle. And seems to imply that the inclusion of these writings in the Leif manuscript is tacit approval of their contents. The Leif manuscript is so ancient that it predates the formation of the New Testament canon. It contains, notice what it says, the Leif manuscript is, is so old that it's before, it's like the anti um, Nicene, you understand, or, or, or Nicene, the, before the Council of Nicaea or Nicene, the Nicaea, Nicaea, Council, but really Nicaea is the more correct pronunciation. But the manuscript it predates the formation of when they decided to which books are in, which books are out. It contained books that were considered inspired by some churches, but were eventually excluded from the Christian canon. Really, should say it was excluded from the from the Roman or the Western Church. Uh, canon. Just like the 1611 King James Version had the Apocrypha included, which eventually was dropped by the vast majority of Protestants, Miss Rippling also misleads the reader by selectively quoting passages from these books totally out of context. Remember what we teach? That if it's not in context and what you got, you got nonsense. One wonders how she could have read the, these passages herself and decide to print such misrepresentations of their contents. For example, a Leif manuscript, King James Version, says, I gave myself, according to Shepherd of Hermes, omit, up to the beast. Right? Now, this is taken totally out of context because what Hermes is saying is that through trusting in Adonai, in the Adoni, the Adonai, he was not afraid to give himself up to tribulation, symbolized by the beast. Now, this is very, very interesting. Remember, we're putting this in, in, in the context and utilizing this to help us better understand this, uh, we could say, this kind of mystery here about the, the two popes, the real pope, the counterfeit pope, his majesty in this comfortable view with the, the, the real pope, you understand, or the Pope Paul the Sixth, not the imposter one right here. And um, let's show you the other picture in case, you just, in case you're just joining us, you understand. In this picture right here, you can tell the, the difference between the two right here, as you can see right here. If we ask you which is, which is um, this pope right here, and then there is this picture right here, and you can see his imperial majesty um, staring straight waily, you know, straight forwardly. And the video is even more galoo. You understand? It's more clear, right? And the New York Times article, the fuller part of the article, which explains some of the, um, the rancor, you understand, and the reasons why his majesty um, um, refused any invitation to the official palace of, 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 of Italy, the Quirinale, not the Vatican, the Quirinale, to meet with really anybody, especially with the Pope or anything like that, in an official state visit because they had stolen goods that they had not returned. But there was something bigger going on in this particular time. And now when we look at the Shepherd of Hermes right here, both the misquote of Gail Miss Ripplinger 
and which is taken out of context. And here's the actual quote here in the context. Gail Ripplinger says that the shepherd of Hermes says to give yourself up to the beast. Right, I gave myself up to the beast is what she's saying the verse reads. But here's the actual verse from Hermes chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. It says, Having therefore, brethren, put on the faith of the Adonai, of the Lord, of the Master, and called to mind the mighty works that he, speaking of Yeshua, Yehoshua, had taught me, I took courage and gave myself up to the beast. I took courage. Now the beast. Now, here's the interesting thing, this part. Pay attention to this in context with what we've been showing. Now, the beast was coming on with such a rush, the whole new world order, you know, the one world government that they were conspiring, that it might have ruined the city, that it might have ruined the city, like Addis Ababa, for example. I come near it, his majesty's visit to, the, to, to Rome and the Quirinale, and huge monster as it was, I mean, just look at it, you know, the Vatican, the whole Catholic system, you know what I'm saying? It stretches itself on the ground, in the ground, in the earth, it's everywhere, you know, and merely put forth its tongue, it merely put forth its tongue, and stirred not at all until I had passed by. Now, in this particular time, His Majesty, this is 1970, and we know four to five years later, he would have passed by. In other words, until that zemin was fulfilled, until that part of the story was sealed up. Now, the average reader surely assumes that the beast here refers to the beast in the book of Revelation. Miss Ripplinger doesn't clarify to the reader that this is not so. Miss Ripplinger is either woefully ignorant of these sub-apostolic writings to whom she has made reference, or she is intentionally misleading her readers. This writer would like to believe or accept as true the former, that she's just ignorant. But there is way too much evidence of consistent willful deception. Remember this, consistent willful deception here. And if the writer were to be so naive as to still give her the benefit of the doubt and regard this as an unfortunate misquotation, the question must be asked, how does this woman think that she has the scholarly wisdom to write a book about subject matter which she has no expertise? Now, the next quote it says, receive his name. Shepherd of Hermes, omit. Again, Miss Ripplinger takes this totally out of context. She makes it sound like Hermes was has received the name of the beast. This is, and we heard the video, and we in the in the, in the previous portion we actually played the video. We showed, I think, we showed the clip as well. But far from it. Read the whole quote from from Hermes. It says. The glorious man saith he is the Son of God, the Bain Ha Elohim, Yehoshua HaMoshi, our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And those six are the glorious angels who guard him on the right hand and on the left. Of these glorious angels, not one, saith he, shall enter into God without him. Whosoever shall not receive his name, whose name? The Son of God, shall not enter into the kingdom of God. It isn't the name of the beast that Hermes is talking about. It is the name of Yehoshua, Yeshua, of Jesus, or Jesus, if you please. Does it not seem to the reader and the listener that something fishy is going on around here? Maybe it is an honest and honest mistake, but the writer and here the reader narrator honestly doesn't see how a woman can claim expertise in an area and demonstrate such shoddy scholarship. Shouldn't we expect a little more care for research than this when it comes to such an important matter? And here's the last point in this that we want to share with you. Just the two or three witnesses, this uh, second, this will be the third right here. The next example destroys any respect that this writer has for this woman, Gail Ripplinger's credibility and honesty. Uh, the Aleph Manuscript King James Version, quote, Satan, dot, 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 is Lord, end quote, Epistle of Barnabas. Omit. This is taken totally out of context because what pseudo Barnabas is saying is that, quote, Satan, dot, 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 ellipsis, is Lord of the season of iniquity that now is. 
Now, remember, put this into context, even with the time of his majesty and, and the imposter pope and all of that. Not that he is Lord over Satan is not the Adonai. He is the Baal. He is the bell, the bell of the season of iniquity that's now. He's not the Adonai over or his life or ours, Barnabas 18, 1 to 2. Read the text in context. Quote, but let us pass on to another lesson in teaching. There are two ways of teaching and of power, the one of light and the other of darkness. And there is a great difference between the two ways. For on the one are stationed the light-giving angels of God, of Ha Elohim Baruchu, and on the other the angels of Ha Satan or Satan or Satana, Yetaragma Yehun. And the one is of the Adonai from all eternity and to all eternity, whereas the other is Lord or Baal, Baal, of the season of iniquity or rebellion, the Amit Agize, that now is. And this is what would happen after His Majesty would pass by, you understand, or would move forward. Now, does the reader smell a rat? This writer does. Miss Ripplinger's credibility in all other matters is virtually destroyed by her flagrant misrepresentation of both biblical and non-biblical literature, even though she uses a lot of um, evidence that was already put out before concerning the NIV and the KJV, which I will ask you to check out for yourself. Miss Ripplinger's lack of, Rip Winkle's lack of knowledge of the history of the biblical literature is evident in her outlandish um, statement on page uh, 537 of her book where she asserts that the church father, Oregon, was the producer of the Septuagint. And we had dealt with that a little bit um, earlier, and that's really why We've heard a lot of other people say that too. And we're like, where do they, uh, like, we've been studying this for a while. We didn't come across that. You understand? Um, the old Greek uh, text. Now, the Septuagint, or what is known as, you know, what is known as the um, the L, uh, what is known as the LXX, Roman letters, LXX for 70 in the Roman letters. The Septuagint was produced around 250 B.C. B.C., remember the dates count down, so that's like 250 years before the Common Era. Oregon lived from 185 to 254 A.D., Maybe they're not reading B.C., A.D. or something like that. How in the world could he have written the Septuagint? If the reader needs proof the Septuagint predated Oregon, he or she can merely turn to Hebrews 10 in the King James Version. One only needs to compare the Septuagint with Hebrews 10 and 5, with Hebrews 10 and 5, uh, to refute Miss Ripwinkle's or Miss Ripplinger's falsehood. And both the manuscripts which underline the KJV King James Version and the ones that underline modern versions read the same. The King James renders Hebrews 10 and 5, which is the quote from Psalm 40 and 6 in this way. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice an offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. If the reader looks in the King James Version at Psalm 40 and 6, it says, Sacrifice an offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. End quote. Why the difference? Because the writer of Hebrews Possibly the Apostle Paulos or Paul was quoting from the Septuagint of Psalm 40 and 6, which says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. How could the Texas Receptus and consequently the King James Version contain a quote from the Septuagint? After all, Miss Ripwinkle, Ripplinger claims that Oregon wrote it. If she is correct, then the letter to the Hebrews must be a third century writing. If Paul authored Hebrews, which many believe and accept as true, and the King James Version goes so far as to say, then Miss Ripplinger could not possibly be right. As a Christian, this writer's practice is to believe or accept the best of people. 
I and I take no joy in pointing out these inaccuracies in Miss Ripwinkle's Riplinger's book, New Age Bible Versions. And he would like to accept as true that the falsehoods in her book are merely typographical errors or mere oversights. But the overwhelming evidence is that this woman is a purposely dishonest one, Satan. Satana is using her book to force a division and suspicion in the body of Christ. In a ministry prior to his current one, the writer experienced personal attacks due to Gail Ripplinger and her ilk. He cannot simply stand by and watch fellow Christian, Christianos or Christians being duped into, quote, poll voting over mouse droppings, end quote, when serious work needs to be done to advance the kingdom of God. This writer could go further in pointing out the flagrant misrepresentation and misleading charts that are contained in Gail Ripplinger's New Age Bible version. To do so would require a book at least as long as, as her book. It is my prayer, and I and I pray that pastors, laypersons um, who have faced personal attacks due to well-intentioned yet ill-informed followers of Ms. Ripplinger, Ripwinkle, will find ammunition here to defend themselves. Um, it is also my prayer, and I and I pray that Miss Ripplinger will honor Jah, will honor God by Jah, because that's in Psalm 68, verse 4, the King James Version, by publishing a retraction of the erroneous uh, portions of her book. Now, we went a little bit forward in that, but as you can clear, clearly see, and you can go over this, you know, yourself, that it's clear that the, the uh, shepherd of Hermas is being distorted and being misrepresented. But then when we look at the context of it, and when we, the Spirit connected this with His Majesty, you know, it kind of explains why His Majesty, after refusing any sort of official contact with with um, the enemies, because the enemies were not fully repentant and they didn't bring the fruit of, 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 of repentance, that his majesty, as it says right here, he, he put on the faith of Adonai and he called to mind the mighty works that he had taught him and taught Adonai. He took courage and gave myself up to the beast. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go forward because there's a lot of conspiracies going on at that time, as we can see with the counterfeit pope, I mean, if they can counterfeit their own pope, you know what I mean, then they can do a lot of other things to a lot of other people, nations, and countries, and so forth and so on. So this is the beast. Now the beast was coming on with such a rush that he might have ruined the city. So essentially he says, I come near it, and the huge monster as it was, it stretched itself on the ground and merely put forth its tongue. It's almost like, like the uh, reptilian. He stuck out his tongue, and it stirred not at all until I passed by, because he put on the faith of Adonai. Remember, his Matthew says, you know, um, putting on Christ, you know, I mean, putting, putting it on and calling to mind, discipline of the mind, those mighty works that Yeshua teaches us, therefore we can take courage, and therefore, when it says give oneself up, don't have any fear. You understand about those trials or tribulations, but trust in what the Adonai, what the Adoni has taught us. So, brothers and sisters, there's, of course, there's probably more, you know, layers to this. But now we understand why His Majesty has such a, 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 a serious. You know, it's such a very, I mean, you have to see the video, and i got to look at the video again now that this is, this is becoming clearly more and more light and illumination to I and I eyes. It, what is very clear in conclusio, you know what I'm saying, in conclusion, is that both of these so-called uh, popes are not the same, are not the same individual. You, you can see the, the, the warmness, the friendliness here the Christian friendliness here, and you can see there's something different going on here. And this shows us that there's a, a big deception has gone on. And it's because when the King of Kings comes, it, it, it changes everything. It's a, it's a whole, as they say, game changer. 
So, brothers and sisters, um, stay tuned. We'll, we'll we'll hopefully deal with deal with additional aspects of that and and get into uh, this or that, y'all willing, or and the other as he wills and as he guides I and I. So, once again, my brothers and sisters, uh, shalom, ras tefari.